Welcome to Project Zygo, uh, workshop number one. This particular workshop is about, we call it, show me the problem. So it's about diagnosing the problem. So with my um, opening remarks out of the way, let me introduce uh, Andrew. I really asked him if he would come and present as the first uh, speaker. He's a very um, interesting fellow. He's, uh, I, I find it fun to listen to him. He's enthusiastic and his heart's in the right place. Uh, the great thing about him is, in my words, is that he has, I'd say three, but I'll stick with, I'll tell you the two and then I'll add the third. Two major viewpoints that sort of overlap and it's really interesting to hear the way he thinks about things. He is a physician, but he also has this background as a, as a designer. That's another way he looks at the world. So he's constantly bringing both of those um, perspectives together and I really love him as a speaker for that reason. And the third thing I was gonna say, which just, goes to who he is, is he's also an artist, and I think you will see that but just in the way he carries himself and the way he thinks about the world. Very creative thinker. Okay, with that, let's put our hands together for Andrew. So I'm going to ask everyone to just stand up and uh, stretch it out. All right, cool. Now sit down and, and hopefully we'll go on a journey together. So let me start with a story. And one of the ways I like to talk and like to teach is it's very interactive. and. Our story starts in 2007. These five people gathered at Stanford at the D School, what's now the Design School, and they came from various backgrounds uh, to work on a project around designing for third world problems. So the course starts and they're faced with this problem, uh, infants being born prematurely. So every year, 20 million infants are born prematurely and they need some assistance to survive. Of that, one million die within the first 24 hours. Four million die within the first four weeks. And there are a host of reasons, but the leading cause of that is hypothermia. When babies are born that early, A, they're not developed enough, they don't have enough fat on their body, they don't, uh, all their systems aren't set up in place well enough to regulate their own temperature and keep themselves at the right temperature. So another problem around this is incubators cost about $20,000 a pop and they require electricity. So even if babies are cared for and able to survive that period, they often have problems that they're going to face downstream throughout the course of their life. So the initial approach. Incubators, right? So expensive. That must be the problem. And so the task at hand, the solution was, how do we make a cheaper incubator? And they set out doing that. Well, fortunately, Linus, one of the team members, ended up taking a trip to Nepal. Here we are. Are you flying to Nepal? There's Nepal. And he made this ink interesting discovery. He's walking around the hospital with the doctors and he's seeing all these incubators that are lying around unused. So all these well-intentioned well countries and companies had said, look at those poor infants in Nepal and they're dying, let's give them an incubator. And so they're donating all these incubators. And they're sitting around the hospital unused and meanwhile babies are dying. And that disconnect was like, what's going on? So he asked the doctor and he said, can you help me understand this? I said, well, the babies aren't dying in the hospital, they're dying in the villages. That was like an aha moment. So he took this back to the team. And the sort of rosy picture story behind it would be, oh, and the team all got on board and they were like excited to, to face this new challenge, but apparently there was a struggle. Like, this is just a, this is just a quarter long class at Stanford. You know, how, how deeply do you want to get into it? We could make a cheaper incubator pretty quickly and get the class over with and check in the box or we can go down this rabbit hole and we don't know where we're going to end up and figure out like okay we're going to chase this problem as we really see it. They had to redefine the need and that's one of the things that we're going to talk about or one of the things I think is really important. It wasn't for a cheaper incubator. The incubator was just a solution to the need. The need was to keep the baby warm. And when you start thinking about it that way, then a whole host of solutions come into play. Right? And the user was not the clinician, was not the doctor in the hospital. It was the new mother in the village. 
without access to medical care and even reliable electricity. So now what do you do with this? So they started doing some testing and prototyping along the whole design construct and the way we do uh, approach design problems. And they started incorporating the findings. So what was the problem? One of the problems they were facing is there's a mistrust of medicine. It was felt to be too strong, right? So in these rural villages where they don't have access to the same amount of education and, and there's different cultural influences, Western medicine felt a little too strong. So if a doctor said, keep the baby at 37 degrees, they're like, you know, that's probably a little too hot. Why don't we go with 30 degrees? And for the clinicians in the room, or for the rest of us, uh, you could tell that 30 degrees is not a good temperature for a baby. So they started incorporating a new design. It was simple, affordable, and easy to deploy to these remote villages, right? And this is the design. This is where the rabbit hole was taking them. And what ended up happening is here are these people that were going to pursue like great jobs in tech and business and I think she was getting an MBA and, uh, and all of a sudden they had this chance to reroute their lives and go down this path. And four of the five of the original team ended up doing that. And they ended up moving to India after graduation and building this company. Uh, this embrace company and making these uh, making these embrace infant warmers and testing it out and using it and this is the rabbit hole of design right like who would have guessed that, that that's where they would be living in India like a few months after needless to say they got lots of awards but more importantly they've been saving thousands and thousands of little babies lives because of this simple solution. And I'm going to go back to this picture and think one of the things that's really interesting here is if we look at our first world solution for babies that are born prematurely, they're in this plastic box under heated lamps and they're kind of uh, you know, sequestered in this area with limited human contact, right? Where is a baby supposed to be at that time? Where? Mother's arms. Mother's arms. Well, yeah. I mean, if it's born prematurely. Where would it ideally be at that point? Inside the mother, right? Like, so now we're taking this baby that's even more dependent than a baby born at term on their mother and that connection and putting them, isolating them in a little box, right? And what does this allow you to do? This allows the mother to sit there and bond with the baby take care of the baby, give them the baby that attention and that connection and that nurturing that it thrives with, right? We know that babies that don't get that nurturing and that attention fail, fail to thrive. And we know that from like orphanages where infants were given all their, like what we think their needs are and, and, and they died because they weren't being like physically held and taken care of in that way, right? So this solution is, I think it's like 200 times cheaper than the incubator, right? And yet, I would argue it's a much better solution, right? I could get into the technology behind it, but the technology is actually really simple. It's very creative in its usage because there's a way to heat this element that then gets slipped into the pouch and it works on, on phase change and absorbs energy at that, at that right temperature. So it keeps the baby warm at the right temperature for up to five hours. And then they just replace the element. And it's easy to heat the element. You can heat it with an electric heater or you can just put it in a pot of boiling water, right? So you can do it anywhere. So here she is getting even more awards and I think there's probably even more awards since then. So present day. And I wanna lead you all in a little thought exercise. You game? Everyone game? Everyone excited to be here? Yes. All right, cool. So, so the embrace is designed for premature babies, about one and a half to two and a half kilograms, right? Now those babies cost on average $275,000 more per baby compared to a baby that's born at term, right? In the U.S. alone, there's about 500,000 babies born prematurely each year. 
if only half of them use this solution versus our current solution, which is a hospital stay and an incubator and all this other stuff. If only half of them, you only found half of them appropriate for this type of treatment. Any idea what our cost savings would be? $7 billion each year. I don't know about you, but I could use $7 billion. I've got a lot of things I could do with $7 billion. I think you're all here because there's this common interest in disrupting healthcare, right? And that sounds so cool and so sexy and all this wonderful stuff, right? Is it sexy? Right? Disrupting healthcare. You guys want to be the ones to disrupt healthcare? So one of the problems I face with doing these talks is, um, as Eric mentioned, I've spent a lot of time in this space. And one of the things I would love to do is be able to cram all that knowledge in and be able to just spit it out at you so you could take it and then go and fix healthcare. Right? And so I'm faced with the challenge of like, how do I get down, how do I distill it down to what would be most useful for you? And so in this case, this is actually one of the, the most important things. So I'm, I'm super glad I was invited to talk about this specific issue because it frames everything. So a little bit about me. I spent the first half of my life working on leadership and teamwork. I, was in, I went to the Naval Academy and was an officer in the Navy. And so I spent 12 years in the Navy. And that was, that was my passion. How do I make the most effective teams possible? And uh, being an artist, uh, my whole life and of course being Indian I couldn't just go study art you know I had to go study engineering and art uh, so I went to Stanford which had an amazing program I did that I spent a year doing robotics uh, an in-depth se sequence in robotics and then worked as a designer I was working at IDEO and doing from freelance work and I said this is all well and good which is great uh, I just wanted something that I could really sink my teeth into. What area needed, what area in our lives needed redesign? And I approached it rather simplistically. I saw doctors running around with pagers. I'm like, I can do better than a pager. Nobody carries pagers anymore. Good Lord. So I could make something better. So healthcare. And as I started investigating that, I found that people that were trying to investigate, trying to work in that healthcare innovation space or healthcare design space were really struggling because they weren't clinicians. And they had choice words to say about working with doctors. And coming from a family full of doctors, I knew exactly what they were talking about. And so I said, well, the solution seems to be to go to medical school. And so I did and faced some choices about whether or not I wanted to jump ship and go into the innovation space right away uh, and had an offer, a beautiful offer at Media Lab to come and teach there and build what they were investigating as their future of medicine, but decided I needed more clinical experience, so I went to residency and moved back to the Bay Area to teach the, or help teach the uh, medical device design class at Stanford. and. I taught that for a few years and now I'm just doing healthcare innovation workshops and leadership in healthcare and whatnot. So that's, that's me in a bigger nutshell than I was hoping to do, but that's me. So disruption, the way to think about it, it falls into one of two categories. So there's two ways typically to do disruption. It's doing something that's never been done before, right? We all know examples of that, right? Cool. This side? Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. The more verbal you are, the better I feel. <laughs> and it's all about me. So uh, doing it cheaper than it's ever been done before. Now this is really important too, right? Like, so when you can do something cheaper, you give more people access to that capability, right? Uh, and the example I used before was the home pregnancy test, which was a cheaper version of of the you know the gold standard of when you go to the when you go to the doctor and get tested and find out you're pregnant now being able to do it cheaper and arguably at first much less reliably uh, brought that technology home and now now a potential mother could figure out am I pregnant am I not pregnant in a way that was much less difficult than it had been before right so I think this is really important, and this is why we're focusing today on this. Sadly, as I've given talks, I've found that all these quotes I love to use were totally made up. 
<laughs> they weren't said by whoever. So I haven't figured out yet if I just, uh, this one is, is suspect, but it actually, it feels like something he would say. Uh, but there are many, Einstein and a number of other people are attributed all kinds of quotes that, that they actually didn't say, but that just goes to like, wow, that's the strength of their, you know, their influence. So I guess my dream one day is to be misquoted in a good way. Um, so if I had 20 days to solve a problem, I would spend 19 days defining it. And what does that mean? And what that means for you all here, and exactly what Eric said was, really understanding like what you're trying to solve is so, so crucial to figuring out how you're gonna go about solving it. Understanding what those needs are. And one of the things that's unfortunate is you have, this, you have this great idea, this great solution, right? That's what we do as innovators and entrepreneurs. We have this idea and we're like, oh, this is so kick-ass. If only everybody did it this way, we'd be great. And you're so like invested in that idea and that solution that it's hard later on as you investigate it to step back and say, oh, wait, is this really the right solution? Is this really, what is the need? And the reason I love that first story is because they were able to zoom out and look at like, what is the need? The need is to keep the baby warm. They approached keeping the baby warm in a way that all these companies and all of these brilliant minds and all these countries hadn't come up with before, right? It's just stepping back and saying, okay, what are we trying to solve? What's the issue here? And not being so wedded to the solution that you came up with, right? So I think of design as one of three ways to uh, develop a product or service. One is, a one is technologically focused, right? You come up with a new technology, an exciting new solution for something. Uh, you know, we can come up with a ton of examples. Any, any thoughts about a technology that then spun up into a business? Google, Google search. Google search. I love that because actually that's the example I use in my talk. Google uh, is a great example in, in the larger six, seven hour workshop I do. Uh, uh, Google, right? It's a new way to search. And a whole arguably huge industry came out of that, right? Great, great example. And we can think of a ton of them. Like, I mean, even that water warmer or coffee warmer, whatever, something like that's new and different and a new way to make it, right? Uh, smartphones, whatever. Different industries came up out of these technologies. Business is another example, right? Like, what's a business opportunity? Any ideas of businesses or I business possibilities that grew into industries or offerings? Starbucks. Did you guys see my slide set <laughs> before? Because it's not on this slide set, but it's, it's seriously on the other, on, on, on my other talk. Uh, that's great, yes, yeah, Starbucks, perfect example. They did not invent coffee, and they didn't invent coffee shops, right? But they saw a niche, a need, that like isn't being met here, and we're like, okay, we're gonna make coffee shops, and we're gonna sell mugs, and t-shirts, and like frappuccinos, and yeah, Starbucks, great example, that's a business need, right? And the third way to think about it is design. And design is very problem focused, right? So it's not about like using a particular technology. It's not about trying to find a particular business. And one of the things I think is really interesting about healthcare, and when I give this talk to clinicians, I tell them they're all designers, right? In many ways. When a patient comes into my office, I look at them as a design problem. I try to really understand their problem and craft a solution that's unique for them. Right? I'm not trying to push a certain pill on everyone, right? Because that would be a technology solution. I'm not trying to push a certain business model on them. But I am trying to craft a solution that will meet their needs. So healthcare is uniquely sort of design oriented. So the trick for you all is this. So how does a fish discover water? What's the problem with the fish discovering water? What's the difficulty? 
it's all around them, right? You just take it for granted, right? It's hard to discover something that you're surrounded by. The only way to discover is to discover water, maybe to be what? Experience, not water. And they're like, this sucks. <laughs> I like water, right? I'm a fish, I like water, I breathe better in water. So it's to discover not water, right? But you don't even know what the water is. That's one of the challenges facing you. You don't even know what the water is. And so one of the things to do is, there's many tricks to doing this, uh, is kind of questioning your very basic assumptions and getting back to like, okay, why are we doing this? In a lot of business courses, they teach the five whys, right? Why, why, why? Do you know why it's only five? I think because if you start going, why, 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 then you start getting to what's the meaning of life? Is there a God? You know, why am I here? And these existential questions that are very difficult to answer, especially if you're trying to make like a new cup of coffee. So, uh, so five whys gets you, distills you down into like, okay, what's the reason we're doing what we're doing? Why have we adopted this particular solution? And are there better ways to answer that need? So this is my famous other, like, favorite misquote. Uh, so Henry Ford apparently was not asked, uh, or did not say, uh, if I just asked people what they wanted, they would ask for faster horses, right? And so as an innovator, as a designer, you have to be able to zoom out and say, why do people want faster horses? Well, they want to be able to get more reliably from one place to another maybe carry more groceries, whatever, like whatever a faster horse would allow them to do and that they don't have the ability to see. And so this is one of the problems with innovating in medicine, right? Uh, that you're working with clinicians and, and providers and an industry that has been trained to do things one way, right? This is the solution. I need a faster horse, right? I need a better scalpel. I need a, I need a better OR light. I need a better way to deliver this medication to a non-compliant uh, non-compliant subset of patients, right? Well, like zoom out. Why are we giving them that medication? What is it we're trying to accomplish? Right? So this is an interesting, uh, this is an interesting story and I'll, I'll end with this. And uh, so this is a story about parachutes. Uh, so the British Medical Journal put out this editorial piece and said, you know, by all medical standards, we cannot say that parachutes really work. And why is that? Right. So half the people have to jump out without parachutes <laughs> to prove that statistically parach that parachutes aren't like just randomly saving people who would have been saved otherwise. So half the people need to jump out without parachutes and then you can conclusively prove parachutes work, right? <laughs> So who wants to sign up for that study? <laughs> so this is, and for many good reasons, but, but this is the standard we set up in medicine, right? We really want to make sure we are what? Not doing harm, right? We are not giving people stuff that's not actually helping them and possibly hurting them. That's, it. that's a very noble and, uh, and wonderful goal, but it also creates this kind of mentality and it's difficult to work around that. So this is kind of the summary of that study or that thing. So it's not all about the evidence either. So just paying attention to your gut and, and where it's going and where that rabbit hole is taking you. All right, so this is me and that's what I do when I'm not taking care of patients, which is most of the day. <laughs> All right, listen, that was awesome. Thank you so much, Andrew. Let's give You're it welcome. Thank you. Us.